Note that throughout this video, when I say pressure function, I really mean pressure disturbance function, which is defined as follows. If there were no sound in the cavity, then the pressure would be uniform. It would be constant everywhere. The pressure disturbance function describes the deviation from this constant pressure due to sound. It's important to remember that both the pressure function and the pressure disturbance function satisfy the wave equation because they're only different by a constant. This constant difference also has no effect on the uniform density incompressible oil equations because they only depend on the gradient of the pressure, which is important because we're going to use them to obtain the boundary conditions. In this video, we're going to calculate the resonance frequencies and associated pressure functions of a cylindrical cavity of radius capital R and length capital L. To do this, we'll obviously need to solve the wave equation, but because the wave equation taken on its own only describes free sound waves, we're also going to need something more. Something to account for the effect of the cavity walls on the sound carrying fluid. The basic plan for this problem will be to first think a little bit about fluid dynamics in order to figure out exactly how to impose the physical effects of the cavity walls mathematically in terms of the pressure function, and then to solve the wave equation for some kind of general solution onto which we can then impose those constraints. However, unfortunately, Unfortunately, before we can get started with this plan, we need to pick a coordinate system. The obvious choice here is definitely cylindrical coordinates, where the positive z-axis of our cylindrical coordinate system aligns with the center of the cylinder and the origin is at one end of the cylinder. For one thing, we know that the wave equation will be separable in cylindrical coordinates, and also because of the cylindrical symmetry of the problem, whatever constraints we have to impose on the solution of the wave equation to enforce the physical effects of the cavity walls will probably probably be simplest in form in cylindrical coordinates. With the coordinate system selected, we can get started on that plan I was talking about. So let's talk fluid dynamics. Thinking about this carefully, we know that the dominant effect of the cavity walls will be to make the perpendicular displacement of the fluid zero at the boundary for all time. This means that the perpendicular velocity component will also be zero at the boundary for all time because they're related by a time derivative. We also expect that in any physically reasonable situation, the fluid carrying the sound will be of uniform density and virtually incompressible relative to the sound pressures involved. This is important because that means that we can use the incompressible uniform density Euler equations to relate velocity and pressure. Because it's the pressure that we're solving the wave equation for, but the direct effect of the cavity walls is on fluid velocity, such a relationship will allow us to extract constraints on the pressure function at the boundary that mathematically account for the effect of the cavity walls in terms of the pressure function. These are the incompressible uniform density Euler equations. If we put the gradient in cylindrical coordinates, we get this three-vector equation. Let's focus in on the radial and z-component equations. If we apply to those equations what we know about the perpendicular component of velocity at the boundary, we get these boundary conditions. These boundary conditions are therefore the constraints that we need to impose on the pressure function in order to account for the physical effect of the cavity walls on the sound-carrying fluid. With the setup finally done, we can get on to the second stage of that plan that I listed at the beginning, which is solving the wave equation for some kind of general solution in cylindrical coordinates that we can then impose those boundary conditions on to get the harmonic pressure functions and the harmonic frequencies. The third step in that plan was the process of actually imposing those constraints itself. Despite the way I explained the plan towards the beginning, it turns out to be more efficient to mix these last two steps rather than performing them in sequence. So that's what we're going to do. And with that, let's get going. Whenever I'm solving a separable partial differential differential equation that involves time, my habit is to first separate off the time dependence from the spatial dependence, and then separate all the spatial variables from each other afterwards. As a result, our starting ansatz looks like this. If we insert that ansatz into the wave equation and then divide by it, we arrive at this equation. Looking at this carefully, we notice that both sides depend only on variables that the other side does not depend on. As a result, they're not only equal to each other, but also a constant. I've selected negative k squared there for mathematical convenience. From this we see that we have two equations, an ordinary differential equation for the time factor, and a three variable pure spatial partial differential equation for the spatial factor. The equation for the time factor is of the form of a simple harmonic oscillator, and as a result is solved by sines and cosines as usual. However, the equation for the spatial factor is still a partial differential equation, so we need to continue with separation of variables. It turns out that the only average 
avenue for separation that works here is to separate off the z dependence first. As a result, this is our second separation ansatz. If we insert that again and divide by the solution, we arrive at this equation. We can then subtract the z dependent terms to the other side of the equation and the constant term on that side of the equation to the side of the equation that the z dependent term used to be on, where I did that last subtraction purely for mathematical convenience. Regardless, we have again arrived at an equation where both sides of the equation only depend on variables that the other side does not depend on. As a result, again, they're not only equal to each other, but are also equal to a constant, where I have also selected the form of this constant for mathematical convenience. We therefore have an ordinary differential equation for the z factor and a two variable partial differential equation for the radial angular factor. Much like the time factor equation, the z factor equation is of the form of a simple harmonic oscillator and is solved by sines and cosines. However, unlike with the time equation, we do have an additional step before we move on to further variable separations. One of our boundary conditions has to do with z dependence, and since the z factor includes all the z dependence that shows up in the overall solution, imposing the z boundary condition on the overall solution just amounts to imposing it to this factor, so it's worth imposing now, right after we've found the general solution for the z factor, in order to just get that done with. Looking at the boundary condition and our general solution for the z factor, we see that if we reject the sine solutions and set a equal to m pi over l, where m is a positive integer, the z boundary condition is satisfied and there are no other solutions that do that. We've therefore not just found the general z factor solution, but specifically the harmonic subset of them. With that in hand, we can move on to finishing the separation process. Our ansatz for separating radial dependence from angular dependence is obviously just this. If we insert that ansatz, then divide by it, and also multiply by r squared, we arrive at this equation. We can then subtract the angular term over to the other side of the equation. At this point, for the third time, we have an equation where both sides depend only on variables that the other side does not depend on. So for the third time, those sides are not just equal to each other, but are equal to a constant, whose form is also selected for mathematical convenience. This produces two ordinary differential equations, one for the angular factor and the other for the radial factor. The angular factor equation is the simpler one. It is again of the form of the simple harmonic oscillator and, of course, is also solved by sines and cosines. Signs. However, here, unlike with the time factor or the z factor, we have to worry about an extra issue with continuity because theta is, of course, an angular variable. Continuity requires us to select either sines or cosines as our solutions and also restrict b to be a positive integer, which I have denoted with a lowercase l here. I happen to select sines for this video because that's my preferred phase convention. At this point, all we have left to do before we can write out the harmonic frequencies and pressure functions is solve the radial equation and impose the radial boundary condition. The first step to solving the radial equation is to use the product rule to evaluate the outer radial derivative. It then helps to switch to the scaled variable x equals cr. Doing this leaves us with a very famous equation indeed, the Bessel equation, sometimes given the more specific name the cylindrical Bessel equation to distinguish it from the spherical Bessel equation. This is extremely good news for our effort to solve this problem because because the solutions to the Bessel equation for integer l, or for any l as a matter of fact, are extremely well known. Specifically, the general solution is any linear combination of cylindrical Bessel functions and cylindrical Neumann functions. Note that the formula on the screen that I have for the cylindrical Bessel functions applies not just for integer l, but for any l. However, the formula that I have on the screen for the Neumann functions only applies for integer l. As it happens, for this problem, we can reject the cylindrical Neumann functions entirely as unphysical because of their singularity at x equals zero, leaving us with the cylindrical Bessel functions for integer l as the physical general solution to the radial equation. With the general physical radial solution in hand, the next step is to impose the radial boundary condition. Where imposing the radial boundary condition on the overall solution just amounts to imposing it on the radial factor because the radial factor contains the only dependence on the radial coordinate in the overall solution. Before we do that, however, we need to make the following definition. 
specifically that xln is the nth zero of the derivative of the lth cylindrical bezel function. With this definition, we can see that the boundary condition is satisfied if c is set equal to xln over r. This value of c then fixes the value of k, and through that fixes the value of the resonant frequencies, and it also gives us the harmonic pressure functions. All we have to do is multiply all the final solution factors, the ones that satisfy all the required boundary conditions and continuity constraints, etc. together. From these harmonic pressure functions, we can also construct a solution for noise in a cylindrical cavity. Specifically, the noise solution is just an arbitrary linear superposition of the harmonic pressure functions. The A constants are amplitudes, and they're fixed by initial conditions. And with these last three key results, we've finished the problem. If you enjoyed this video, or at least found it interesting, please consider sharing it with a friend, giving it a thumbs up, and subscribing.